Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We are honored to be sitting down with Eric Yakes. Eric is a author, particularly of The Seventh Property, Bitcoin and the Monetary Revolution, which was released earlier this year. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining us today. Happy to be here, man. It's good to meet you. My pleasure. Well, we're going to talk a lot about Bitcoin today. However, I think the the exciting thing about Bitcoin in relation to other cryptocurrencies is the influence or the impact that it can have on traditional financial affairs, and that it's a part of basically the collective consciousness currently, whether it's from regulators to public servants, now referred to as authorities, or um, even the retail public or just the, the people, if you will. And that is, I think, what individuates Bitcoin from the rest of crypto. The rest of crypto is referred to as altcoins for a reason. It's because they reference themselves into context, in context of Bitcoin. In fact, I went to a precious metals conference recently, and I thought it was absurd how much discussion of altcoins there was to an audience who did not understand fully proof of work or Bitcoin in general. And certainly, I think anyone who um, read the audience, Bitcoin was certainly the 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 most um, the asset most for commodity, most outside of the precious metals industry that anyone there should have heard of, not for instance, mm-hmm. Hedera, Hashgraph, et cetera. So that's what's exciting about Bitcoin. So I want to sit down and, and start with uh, global events that are taking place. We've got the the raising of the the debt ceiling or actually just the uh, abolition of the debt ceiling, perhaps. I think Janet Yellen, she's got a very creative uh, solution. Just get rid of the debt ceiling altogether so we don't need to uh, worry about a looming government shutdown as we have for like, what, the last 10 years or so. Um, What are your thoughts on that, Eric? And uh, what else are you keeping an eye at globally? Yeah, um, the the debt ceiling, you know, uh, my thoughts at a high level is that this is political theater that we do every year. And um, it gets it, what I think is most, uh, which shows how much of a marketing campaign gets pushed for this whole debt ceiling controversy. It's really the only time that you see public fi- financial officials, um, you know, scream bloody murder about what would happen in financial markets if the debt ceiling didn't get raised. I mean, you see all these other scary situations emerge in markets, and you see public officials saying, "Oh, we have it under control." They're trying to keep sen- sentiment in a positive light. And it's only when the ever debt ceiling comes out that they're like, oh, okay, um, you know, be very afraid. We got to raise this thing and we need bipartisan support for it. And I think what was interesting is when I was watching the Senate hearing committee a few days ago, and I was tweeting a bit about this, um, the Democrats could pass a raise to the debt ceiling unilaterally, unilaterally because of the amount of control that they have. So it's not really a question of if the debt ceiling would get raised. Um, they, they could do it themselves very easily as an amendment to the, in the, uh, um, in the bill. But uh, with the amount of lip service that gets paid to, oh, we need to raise this and it would be catastrophic if we didn't is because they're trying to, it's this political theater where they're trying to get bipartisan support to actually have both sides of the party get their fingerprints on the bill so that in the future, you know, they can go back and say, oh, well, the, the Republicans also wanted to increase the debt ceiling as well. So it's a form of future leverage that they're really just, you know, playing a game of chicken with each other over and the Republicans are going to say, no, we don't want to do that. And, you know, they're going to be pushing public opinion through their media outlets, however, which way they can do it. And they're playing a political game and they're putting the, um, you know, the credit of the global sovereign currency at stake over this game but it's not really a question of whether or not they can pass it and then there's also this whole like mint the coin thing going on that was you know publicized heavily through like Rohan Gray and some of his papers and Joe Weisenthal is all on board with it um a lot of debate on that I think that uh my take is it works um it well it could work and the argument against is if there is uh if you can legally interpret the constitution in a way that something like that could actually work and people could say okay well because the federal government um has the power to coin these specific types of money then we can use that to circumvent the congressional power of you know being able to um raise our debt ceiling so like um I guess it works. And um, I honestly, with the way that I view the world, I think for people that don't view Bitcoin as being the alternative monetary system that's eventually going to dominate, 
they might view that as a very silly thing to do and a very bad thing to do for our current system. But because I view um, that we have this private decentralized emerging system that people can opt into, I, I, I think the more ridiculous things get in our current financial system, the better. I mean, let's just, let's rip the bandaid off. Let's let this happen really quickly. And let's, let's do some sort of ridiculous concept like this and let's move on with our lives. But, um, but yeah, so there's chalk it all up to, it's pretty much just political theater and they can raise the debt ceiling and there's a variety of avenues they can do that through. With the Bretton Woods monetary system post-World War II, the US dollar became the world reserve currency and was pegged to gold at that time up until around, or at least a partial peg on gold, up until 1971 when it the peg was lifted and the US dollar then became strictly a fiat currency. I would say obviously that was kind of the start of a, of a new monetary system. And we've obviously piled on the debt since then, 30 trillion thereabouts is the current debt in the US. And I think with the recent discussions, uh, especially with uh, kind of this attitude that the debt doesn't matter, we're entering into a yet a new kind of monetary system, a modern modern monetarism is what it's termed. And this essentially is a, a continuation of the Keynesian uh, view. However, mm -hmm. debts don't matter in under a monetaristic system. And the governments can print money ad infinitum, <clears throat> which of course devalues the currency, which harms the poorest, the worst, ad nauseum. What are your thoughts on the fact that we might be actually kind of entering into a, a new monetary system, especially over the last year or so. Yeah, uh, I think that it is a very politically convenient solution. Um, and, you know, when you dig into modern monetary theory, I think what it boils down to of whether or not you believe in a theory is, um, will we have govern, is, do you trust governing bodies in the long run to control the most uh, valuable construct that we have in society. That's what it boils down to. Because modern monetary theory, if we could trust agents um, that have a conflict of interest with us and we can go against the economic law, the you know, agency problem and the moral hazard that results from that, um, if you can trust that, then modern monetary theory could make a lot of sense. It could be an efficient mechanism where we can control things in an economy. Um, but that's the issue is, uh, do you trust that? And I think that history tells us that the most horrible, horrible things that have ever happened in any society are the, precisely because of the amount of power that gets centralized in certain institutions and particularly over the ability to control people's, uh, people's value and wealth. Um, so I, I, that, that, that's generally my take on modern monetary theory. And when you have the academics who don't have the real world experience and, um, have the incentives also put in front of them to create different theories that would support politically convenient solutions, um, then I think that in those worlds, it makes a lot of sense to them. But when you get into the worlds of people and consequences and um, in real, real lives, then it's a very different picture. And people who, you know, read into history and how these things happen in the first place. In your view, how does Bitcoin fit into history? Hmm. Um, and, so and, yeah, go ahead. And uh, yeah, and I could just start off, uh, yeah. at, um, you know, when I got into Bitcoin, it was essentially, uh, espousing sound money principles, which were rooted in Austrian theories of economics, which essentially, um, are, is a, a, uh, academic basis for like free marketing or free markets. And, uh, it was also a continuation, and I think Patrick Byrne has made this point. It's really con a continuation of uh, Western civilization ideals, such as like dating back to the Magna Carta, into the Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, Constitution in the U.S., as well as classical liberal theories of uh, economics. So, of course, we use this term liberal today, but I, I, I doesn't mean quite what everyone uses it to mean. A liberal is actually mm -hmm. a, a open-minded um, <laughs> liberal person for lack of a better word uh, however <laughs> one one aspect of that is uh classical liberalism from an mm -hmm. economic perspective was also free market minded so the, for me mm -hmm. that's kind of uh bitcoin represents sort of continuation of at the very least uh, these principles upon which uh the constitution the bill of rights declaration of independence uh were based mm -hmm. upon so what mm -hmm. are your thoughts yeah so i i think that there are 
certain aspects. Okay. So I guess in the context of what you're saying, <clears throat> this is very high level theoretical topic, but um, so within societies there, you want as many things to be privatized as possible. Um, you want things where there isn't a conflict of interest um, between participants where they can organize themselves because that's the most efficient way of doing things, which allows people to accumulate wealth most rapidly. But there are things within society that have fundamental characteristics, um, primarily due to information asymmetries and um, how it's hard for people to move ge geographically rapidly. Um, so because you can't just like get up and move to new places very easily, it's a very expensive thing to do. Um, and we have information asymmetries where not everybody is fully aware of what would make the best good or service for them or provide them something at the best price at any given point in time. Those are the kind of the constraints that we're operating within this world in. And, um, and sometimes governments have to intervene and provide certain services where we do have these constraints, which ultimately result in people taking advantage of one another through a conflict of interest. Um, so I think that you know, we see this with monopolies, natural monopolies that emerge and governments that need to control some of these in industries to remove that inherent problem. Um, the bigger question, and I think that this is probably the hardest one for like libertarian type ideologies to answer is the concept of externalities and when those externalities are negative, um, how to control for a lot of that. And I think that's a pretty salient topic today with what's going on with, uh, in a pandemic. And um, I think that it's not to say that government isn't necessary, but in the long run, we can see that a lot of these issues, these natural monopolies, these information asymmetries, and these constraints get solved through technology as we evolve. Um, we are currently at the most uh, information transparent environment we've ever been in in the world today, and that's only getting better. And we should not constrain that because that's the most important thing. It's much easier for people to respond and for consumers to organize against, you know, organizations that are taking advantage of them when information is readily apparent. People can say what they want. So I think that with money um, and when, well, taking a step back to your point about the Constitutional Convention, um, that, that's a great example of when we created a system, we created a balance of powers, we created this transitive type structure. It's like rock, paper, scissors, you know, each point has a control over the other point, nobody has full control over anything. Um, and we created that system and it was a trade-off. And we said, well, you know, there are, we could have a dictatorship and you can run countries and that's how it's been for most of history. And there's inherent moral hazard that it results in giving centralized authority power over a vast amount of wealth in people's lives and their labor. And we said, we want to create a society that eliminates that. We created this genius concept and we created these, this balance of powers and it worked. And then we had the fastest growing capitalist society in history to become the largest economy and most powerful economy in the world. I mean, think about that. Think about how quickly the US grew under this system. Now, the system was much slower than a dictatorship. It's much harder for us to pass laws. And we said, okay, well, we will take that trade off in order to not let leaders start to, you know, appropriate our wealth from us over time. So that was a necessary trade-off that we took. And with money, you can see a very similar trend throughout history where in, in, um, in antiquity, money was primarily decentralized. Um, this isn't, it's actually a very old concept. It's probably the oldest concept of money. People created money themselves. They stored money themselves and they verified money between one another themselves. There weren't specialized party that were controlling any of these functions when we're talking about very primitive societies and localized groups. As we started to scale and as organization became much more complex, centralization needed to occur in one of those three functions in a variety of ways. And we can see how society kind of trended that direction over time. And, um, you know, the first thing to get monopolized was the um, centralization of production by governments when people started to take advantage of money and dilute it. And then ironically, and this happened with each one, governments ended up committing the same crime when they were given control over it as well. Um, then it happened with storage of money and we created banking systems and then governments attempted to control those with central banking and that's how that emerged. Um, so we saw this trend in centralization of all these functions over time. And uh, here we are today in the most centralized financial system in history. And um, it has inherent moral hazard. 
and people are taking advantage of us every day. People are taking wealth from other consumers. We have extreme wealth inequality. It hasn't been this bad since the Great Depression. And um, Bitcoin ties into all of that because it was the same concept that the founding fathers created when they said, okay, this got bad. Um, and Bitcoin couldn't have been created, obviously, at that time because we didn't have the technology there. But now that we have the technology that we have today, we had a feasible innovation to say we can actually decentralize this as well. And we can create something in a system that's much more slow moving, um, that can't be controlled by anybody. And that's the trade off we're taking. We're going to say, okay, well, we don't want anything to change about it. And the Federal Reserve can change something about our monetary policy in the blink of an eye. But we're going to remove that benefit of efficiency because we don't want to trust the centralized party with control over our money who is going to you know, enact policy that will benefit them or their interests or their organizations at the cost of broader society. Um, so I, yeah, I agree. I think it's, it, it's a very parallel concept to, uh, to a lot of things that have happened in history that have enabled freedom. Not long ago, the global financial crisis shook markets. There was a trillion dollar bailout, which certainly caught my attention. And not long after that, a couple of movements, Bitcoin being one of them, formulated. Uh, Bitcoin, of course, was an idea in, in uh, by October of 2008 that was in the public domain. On, on Halloween 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto printed the or uh, published the ideas to, uh, I believe, the IRC mailing list. And then uh, by January 3rd, 2009, uh, the system had been released onto the internet. And of course, that was around approximately the same time as the bailouts were being publicized on headlines in like New York Times, where of course all the news that's fit to print always seems to benefit a certain few. But with that said, I want to also point out that Occupy Wall Street was a movement that cropped up at that time. And I think the interesting thing about Occupy Wall Street that it did at least identify a power center and there was sort of a cogent idea about perhaps where inequalities were rising from. Also, there's a long history in this country that's well documented about Wall Street malfeasance and also kind of its empowerment of what is termed historically as robber barons. So while Occupy Wall Street fizzled out, Bitcoin did not. What were your thoughts at that time during the global financial crisis? And uh, did that impact your journey towards Bitcoin at all? Yeah. So, I mean, during the financial crisis, I was, what was I? I was a freshman in high school and I didn't really care much about it. But uh, when I got into college um, and I was studying finance and economics, that was definitely, I, I cut my teeth on uh, the history of the global financial crisis. And so it was kind of an interesting time because it's that that's what ultimately influenced my financial perspective. Um, but I think that um, the financial crisis emerged through um, a partnership between governments and banks. And this partnership resulted in risk taking where insurance was provided with, that wasn't there. And a variety of different financial products. So, um, you know, what you would expect to happen is what happened. It's just really a question of, um, it was just a question of finding it over time. And there's some guys who got ahead of it and they figured out where that's happening. And that's happening in a bunch of other industries right now too, again. And um, the this partnership that exists between politicians and financiers exists because they both need each other in some sort of form. Um, the financiers need the laws and they need the barriers that allow them to remain this small group of um, very, very large banks that controls practically everything. And um, they, they bring in the money and they're kind of the weapon. And then the politicians, um, you know, shift back and forth between working for their firms or working for organizations financed for their firms and enacting policies that benefit them in some sort of way. And this is the game that's incentivized when you have centralized control over our money. Um, and that's, that's one of the beautiful things about Bitcoin is that bailouts will no longer exist. It will be impossible to bail anybody out. And this risk taking and this excess and a lot of these issues that people are so angry about, um, that will be significantly mitigated. Now, will it completely go away? Well, no, credit, credit will still exist within an economy with Bitcoin and credit is a form of money. Um, so 
as long as credit exists, there's going to be ways to effectively like bail out, um, but not, you know, something that would pale in comparison to the scale that things are currently happening at. And um, so I think that's one of the big pieces. And your, your point about Occupy Wall Street and how that's kind of fizzled out, um, that's one of the tragedies that I see. And that's something that the politicians and the bankers, um, I think, do a really good job at is pushing this narrative that it's maybe not as much of bankers, but um, the politicians looking for votes. They push this narrative that this is capitalism's fault. And, and it's interesting because politicians used to campaign with a stance on central banking. And today, um, nobody knows anything about it. They don't know how it works. Nobody knows how our banking system works. And it's very confusing because it's circular. So people have a very hard time understanding how it works. And because of that, um, People are associating issues that come from our from our monetary policy and our banking system, and the negative outcomes from that, like wealth inequality, like all the rising prices and why things are getting so expensive, but people aren't making as much money, um, and where all this greed and all these bailouts and um, all this excessive risk taking and malinvestment and overconsumption, they associate all of that with capitalism because that's what the narrative in these mainstream media outlets are pushing with people. And then you have movements like Occupy Wall Street, like this is capitalism's fault. It is so far from the point. Um, and, it, and it's a tragedy because not only do you have to, when you're talking to people, not only do you have to argue for some of these principles that you believe in, but you also have to help them relearn some of the concepts that are currently just ingrained in their head. And, um, and yeah, I think it's a tragedy. I think it's a tragedy that people think it's capitalism's fault when capitalism is what created the largest country with the highest living standard in the shortest amount of time in history. And, um, and people use that against uh, what's actually just a centralized group that's controlling our money and sucking a bunch of wealth out of other people without them even knowing it. And um, yeah. Conservatively speaking, people our age have never lived underneath the capitalist system. So it's being, right. so it's really a uh, um, lack of knowledge of terms, really. So yep. a central bank is not a capitalist institution. Yep. Um, there's a few other uh, three-letter agencies, which uh, I'll leave unmentioned, that are not capitalist institutions. You mentioned also about how you know Bitcoin could rein in some of the spending we see back in the day uh, of, like, say, the 14th century. The kings and queens who were constantly at battle with each other mm -hmm. uh, off, would have to, would run out of money actually, and they would have to go back to the bank in order to uh, continue the war. So at least there was some sort mm -hmm. of uh, uh, end to the fighting, if only. Yeah it was at the whim of a banker's loan. However, mm -hmm. today we don't even have that uh, check or balance, mm -hmm. um, if you want to call it that. Uh, it was really just a limiting factor. So here we can have this concept of endless wars, which is really a concept uh, that's made possible by institutions like the Federal Reserve. So the central banking, when did you first, well, let's back up. I think, um, what is capitalism to you? Could you describe like what capitalism means to you? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I guess like it's like it's lost up, and it, it it's kind of vague. Like to to your point, I agree. I wouldn't say that we're in a capitalist society anymore, um, but it's 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 kind of hard to define that. I remember I was reading something from Milton Friedman back in the eighties. Um, I think it was actually on one of his old video shows, and he kind of defined whether or not we are in a capitalist society by the percentage of like social welfare programs that are a part of like our um, federal budget. And I think that's kind of a good way to look at it. And um, we're, you know, we have more social welfare programs that exist in history. Why is our wealth inequality so bad if we're helping people more than we ever have? And that's a big question that nobody ever asks. Um, but back to your point, how would I define capitalism? Um, I would say that Capitalism is in a society where we have protected uh, an individual's right to their property to the highest degree that we can, um, at least in proportion to um, the majority of the goods and services that they have that are private. So if, let's say, we all live in a society and we have common um, resources that we interact with and we pay governments to do use those common resources. Some may be appropriate, some may not be, but some are definitely appropriate. Um, and some percentage of your wealth 
is um, given to pay for those resources every year through some form of tax. And I would say that you can still live in a capitalist society and have those things as long as an individual has a right to their private property um, that isn't at least infringing upon the majority of their property. I guess maybe that's a good way to define it. Um, perhaps not a majority. May I don't know. It'd be hard to say. It's hard to say what the actual line is between when you cross out of capitalism. But what was important for our capitalist society was that the U.S. protected property rights better than any other country in the world. And that's what ultimately attracts the smartest people to a place. So um, having strong protection of property rights is probably the most important thing. And that requires a legal system to be able to do that effectively. For me, uh, capitalism really largely, well, I think these terms capitalism and, and communism, they're so loaded that they're almost just like not even worth. Uh, exactly, yeah. However, I believe that like free markets are just a, a simple concept in which people, individuals namely, are able to enter into um, voluntary agreements, contracts, and transactions mm -hmm. with one another without the interference of a third party or middleman. Um, you know, I think that when we look at kind of the founding father's vision of a country, the U.S., we see that it was, uh, I think, uh, a very limited amount of responsibility that the government had, and it was split up into states' rights and uh, federal rights, and any rights that were not enumerated in these documents in the in the Bill of Rights Constitution then fell onto the states and to the people. The government couldn't take those rights away, and those it, you take it even further. Actually, those rights were granted not by government but by a higher power, God, um, and in the in our founding fathers' minds, the Christian mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. Now. Central banking. Now, when did you first begin learning about central banking? And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Yeah, I mean, I got interested in it back when I was in college. Um, and it, what I read was just, it was pretty much just what I learned in school about it. And it's that we have central banks to control interest rates to reduce economic volatility. The Federal Reserve has this dual mandate. And, um, and that's just the way things are. And I had never got any education on the history of central banking when I was in school, which I think is pretty absurd. Um, I got a history in one class on economic theory and kind of how that evolved over time, which was one of my favorite classes. But um, how central banks emerged and all of that, I, it took me years to get into that. I think that my journey was I graduated college. I was always libertarian. Um, I kind of cut my teeth on the monetarists and Milton Friedman. And uh, that eventually led me to the Austrians. And um, I always had, I, I, I don't like to put myself into groups, but I would say that most of my principles, I would probably fall into the libertarian camp. And um, as time passed, I you know, got into industry and I was working in finance and I, was, uh, I started off at a management consulting firm and we we're the largest corporate restructuring firm in the world. So it's kind of weird because we do like investment banking type stuff too. Um, but you got to, we dealt with in restructuring, it means like we dealt with companies that were having a lot of problems. And because we're big, we're dealing with like really big companies with really big problems. And so you see a lot of ways that things can go wrong in economies, like in our, in our economy, in a position like that. And then I moved to a private equity fund that specialized in investing in companies that were kind of going through issues. And um, so I'm kind of seeing a lot of these issues. And I mean, you do it for long enough, you just kind of get used to it. And I, I feel like over for a while, it was just always like, oh, this is just the way things are. Everything's pretty ass backwards. Like, that's the modern economy. I don't know how that's going to change. And um, one of my good friends who was working in my first company with me, he was always pushing Bitcoin on me, but he, he, he had more of a background in like tech. So like he, he was interested in the technology of it. He's like, it's this really cool thing. It does all this cool stuff. And, you know, I have a background in economics and finance. So I'm just like, I don't really care how cool it is. I don't understand it. I don't know what it's worth. And, um, but he kept kind of bringing it up with me. And, you know, eventually I was kind of like, all right, I'll, I'll look into this thing. And I spent some time reading. And once the aspect of how Bitcoin can enable freedom within our system, once I started reading some material that was related to that, and I can't even remember what it was at this point, I think I was just like reading stuff on Reddit back then. Um, that's when it kind of clicked on me. And I was like, this is interesting. And I started to read a bit more. And then once it clicked to me, like, oh, this is a way that we can compete against our incumbent financial system. Uh, that's when 
I started to go a lot more down the rabbit hole and spend a lot more time reading about Bitcoin. Um, so with central banking, I started to get deep into, I didn't get, you know, through that process, I was still working. So that was kind of happening in like the 2016, 2017 range. And then it was towards the end of 2019. Um, I, I, I'd read a decent amount and I'd figured out a, a lot more about central banking and our banking system at that point. But it wasn't until I quit my job at the end of 2019 to jump into this industry that I, first thing I was like, okay, I want to get deep into a lot of areas. And that's when I got pretty deep into central banking. And um, I think through that process was when I decided I wanted to write a book um, because I, it, it was just obvious to me. I was getting into this industry and I'm like, okay, well, I'm this guy coming out of a technical area of finance and I'm trying to justify why Bitcoin is valuable to me. And I read a lot of the books in the industry and I was like, I don't think anything totally sold me. Um, some of them have good bits and pieces here. Some of them are a little bit too moralistic about things. Some of them are a little bit too theoretical about things. Um, and for me to write, I, I wanted to write something that was the book I wish I'd been given so that I didn't have to spend all this time searching around the internet and digging through all these areas of history and reading all these books that I probably only need to read 10% of to get the relevant information for this thesis. So I started, that's when it clicked is getting deep into, um, you know, financial history, central banking, money, um, and reading a bunch of areas that I hadn't had the time to read before. And I was just like, yeah, you know, there's definitely a book here that needs to be written. And that's when, um, that's probably when I learned the most about central banking is through that whole process. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of interesting things. I, you know, in my book, I kind of go through like, here's how our the banking systems originated in the first place, which is an interesting story, or at least how are, it, these are very broad, complex topics. So like I focused on what's relevant to people in the US, um, but obviously from a global perspective, there were banks emerging all over the world in different areas at different times. Um, but at least our, our modern system is kind of based around the um, central bank or the uh, banking system that emerged in England. And, um, so I, I, I started off kind of going into that and uh, our modern banking systems are all based around just like this goldsmith banking community that was formed in England. And, um, and then the central bank was actually, the, the Bank of England was actually created when Charles II was a pro, or a borrowing from these goldsmith bankers and he defaulted um, and he wanted to pay them back with printed fake fiat money. So he created the Bank of England to do that. And those bills were rejected from the market immediately. And they subsequently went back to a gold standard and these goldsmith bankers never even got their money back. And um, like, that's how the first central bank that like we're really based around, like there's others that were, you know, created in Venice and things like that, but that our current modern system is based around, um, that's how it started. And uh, this whole lender of last resort problem was just because the government was borrowing from the private sector and defaulting on it. Um, so, and then that evolved and then the banks started to emerge all over Europe. And then we came to the US and then the constitutional convention convention was a highly debated topic around central banking. And at the end of the day, we needed them to finance wars. And that's kind of like one of the sad truths of history is like, as much as we hate banking, um, you know, some of these fiat programs might've been what allowed the US to remain independent as well. Um, but, um, but in any event, then we get into our, you know, Federal Reserve System. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that there were three central banks that came before the Federal Reserve was even instituted. And one of those ended in fraud under the chairman. Um, and, you know, we get to where we are today. And now the system is just so much more complicated. And once uh, we're, we're on and off gold standards of different mandated percentage ratios for, you know, most of the 20th century. And then we get to when Nixon... Um, repealed the gold standard and we've been in a pure fiat system ever since um, that's when things get a lot more confusing because then you get in this concept of well money is just debt now what does that mean well it's a circular concept and um, and because of that uh, our how, how money is created how it flows through our banking system how credit is created and contracts so easily how the Federal Reserve is trying to backstop a lot of this volatility through all these different programs and tools that they have, um, that all gets complicated. And in my book, I tried to summarize that to a basic level 
um, to the minimum level that I think people need to understand it in order to really see why Bitcoin is valuable and a good alternative to a system that creates credit like this. Now, that being said, credit systems will exist within Bitcoin, but when you emerge or uh, when you remove the moral hazard inherent in our centralized control over credit in our current system, um, that's when the incentives are at least proper. And when people take on too much risk and they extend too much credit, um, then they're going to have to pay the consequences of doing so. And hopefully investment starts to shift towards things that are most productive that most people want. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the, that was kind of a long drawn out answer to all of it, but yeah. Tell us more about the seventh property and like what people can expect from it when they pick it up. What are some of, uh, I think the, the main points you make and, uh, you know, insofar as you're willing to share. Yeah, totally. Um, I, so the book's like 14 chapters. And like I was saying earlier, it's um, the seventh property is the book that I wish I'd been given when I first discovered Bitcoin. Cause when I first heard about it, it was technically I was a senior in college in 2015. And I was just like, it has no fundamental value. Um, I can, even if it does, I have no way of measuring it. Therefore, how do I invest in something like that? And I maintained that perspective for a few years or I guess about a year or two years. And um, so for people who have, particularly for people with a financial background, it, it applies broadly, but I think for people who have this entrenched view, um, like value investors and have a financial background, um, I think that my book is the case that will really show them that you don't want to conflate these concepts of market value with monetary value. And these are different paradigms of thinking. And um, that when you view Bitcoin through the lens of monetary value, and it makes sense, people are confused about that, viewing it through that lens, because we really haven't had something emerge in millennia that has forced them to think in that type of way. Um, it's always been gold or something backed by gold for a very long time. And, uh, once you view it through that lens, and I think it makes a lot more sense. And it took me a while to get there. And then once I got there, I was like, ah, it makes a lot more sense to me. And then I'm like, okay, well, then Bitcoin is superior across. So taking a step back, um, pretty much what I do is I, I try to walk you through everything that you need to know before we even talk about Bitcoin. So the first half of the book, and it's basically 50-50, um, the first half is me talking about money and banking. And um to start off with money, you need to understand all these different concepts about, I see people mixing them up all the time and talking about them in ways that I think confuse people, but they're actually not that hard to understand. But it's like, okay, well, what is money? Defining that theory, what does it mean for money to be backed by something? Um, and then what is, um, you know, people hear about these functions of money all the time, store value, medium of exchange, unit of account. And then people will also hear about like, what are monetary properties? And then people are like, oh, well, it needs to be scarcity and um, it needs to be widely accepted and all these other different properties. People are like, okay, well, how do I, how does this all tie together? In the first chapter, I just like bring all that theory together and say like, here is the theory behind all this. Um, and here's how it all ties together and relates. And um, once you have that, that framework in your head, then you can just like look at different monetary goods and say like, okay, this would be more or less an effective monetary good. And the challenge comes down to your ability to measure these properties. But effectively, money needs to have certain properties for it to do what it's supposed to do. This all assumes free markets where money isn't enforced upon a society, which existed for most of history and uh, or for a lot of history. And um once you have that framework, then I start to move into history and I start to say, okay, well, here's how money evolved over time. Here are different forms of money. Here's how forms of money emerged that had superior properties. Here's how paper money emerged. It was superior and more efficient in a variety of ways, but it didn't, it lacked the property of scarcity. And um, because paper money wasn't scarce, it needed to be backed by something that was scarce, like gold, which was money before it. So we said, okay, well, we can use paper, which is much more portable. We can move it across distances very easily. Um, it's easy to keep it fungible and standardize it. It's much cheaper. Once we had, you know, the printing press and the telegraph um, and double entry bookkeeping technologies emerged and paper was just moving value all across the world very rapidly, um, much quicker than gold ever would have done. So as long as we kept that paper backed by something that was scarce, the system would work. And that's what the term backing of money means in the first place. And it only emerged once paper money emerged because paper didn't have the inherent monetary property of scarcity. Um, so I kind of walk through that history and describe events like that to make things make a lot more sense. And then, um, and then once I get into that, it's like, okay, well, 
then people started to encounter as they gained more and more wealth, the storage of money. And then we had our modern banking systems that emerged in England, like I was talking about earlier. And I had talked about how those evolved and you know how uh, we had central banking emerge in France and in Switzerland. Um, and then I bring that into the US and then I start to focus on US history, the central banks that came before it. Um, and the you know different wars that occurred and how fiat money was prevalent in those and when the U.S. would go in and out of these different uh, levels of gold standard and then when it was repealed and then I finally get into um, the uh, uh, the modern system and I would say for me personally and I don't know some readers are really into it but um, I think it's the most valuable thing but what surprised me more than anything is when I went down this rabbit hole into this industry I could not find a resource that explained how the Federal Reserve worked anywhere. And maybe it's out there and I just still haven't found it, but I spent a lot of time looking and I couldn't find anything. The closest thing I pretty much found was uh, The Creature of Jekyll Island. And that book is a brick and has a lot of other stuff in there that I think is, you know, speculative. But, um, but in terms of like, you know, here's how the Federal Reserve actually works, there really is very little information out there. There's other very high level things that are like, oh, well, you know, think about it like this um, and use analogies. Or there's like technical papers that barely anybody could understand and has the time to read. So I have this chapter dedicated, like here's everything the Federal Reserve does. Here's their tools. Here's how they can manipulate our economy with those tools. And, um, and then I kind of tie that all together and say like, here's where we are today. And here's all the problems that ex exist now because of all these events that have occurred and how our current system works and how money works and how it um, should work and how that's changed. And then once you have that background, it's like, okay, now we can talk Bitcoin. And then I get into Bitcoin. And I think when I got into the space, I found that once again, there was either a lot of information kind of at the extremes. There was either like highly um, technical stuff that you might have to have a developer background to get into. Um, that explains Bitcoin, or there's all these like analogous forms of explaining Bitcoin um, and blockchains and things that don't really get to the technical level needed to fundamentally understand it. And uh, so I wanted to find the happy medium where I, from, I, you know, taught myself Python and got through like Jimmy Song had his programming Bitcoin book and I got through all that. I was like, okay, like you don't need to know programming to explain some of these concepts to people. You can explain these concepts. So, so I, I get a bit more te technical than like the average uh, resource would get. And, um, but I think pretty much, you know, anybody can get there and understand it. It's, uh, I, I try to define all terms. I start off just with basics of computing at a really high level. Um, because I mean, for me, I'm just like this, you know, idiot finance guy who didn't know how anything in tech worked before I started reading into this industry. So like, there's some really basic things that I needed to teach myself before I could grasp a lot of it. So I explained some of those things too. And, um, you know, and then I get into, once you have that kind of technical understanding, it's like, okay, well, then you can understand how the network works and how the incentives between everybody work. And that allows um, all the decision making to happen for this like entity, this decentralized network to actually function. And here are the rules that everybody has to follow that we've achieved, you know, consensus upon. And then the last portion of it um, is me tying that all together and saying like, okay, so knowing how Bitcoin works now, we can compare Bitcoin to all these other forms of money, <clears throat> money that we've discussed in the book. And we can say monetary property by monetary property, how Bitcoin is pretty much superior in everything other than acceptability. Um, and those monetary properties that I talk about, there's currently six of them in economic literature. But uh, I try to do, I think that Bitcoin's kind of defined as seventh. And I get into a lot of that in the book. And that's, that's where the title comes from. Um, and then lastly, I have the final chapter is just a list of all the criticisms of Bitcoin. And, um, and I just go through those line by line and my, and provide the arguments for and against. And I, that was one of my priorities with the book was to take a very measured approach. And there are criticisms of Bitcoin that are legitimate. And none of the criticisms of Bitcoin, I believe, are detrimental to its long-term viability. And I form arguments that I think um, 
support all of that in the final chapter, as well as show you why they are legitimate arguments and problems that Bitcoin is going to have to get sorted out over time. Um, and that's that's pretty much the gist of it. So like if people are serious about understanding Bitcoin, I think that this is this is the resource to do so. And um, and it's going to give you a very good theoretical understanding to when, you know, you're rolling into the holiday season and you're arguing at Thanksgiving or at Christmas with your family members about Bitcoin. This is going to give you everything you need to tell them why they're wrong and you're right. You've mentioned a lot of history there and I want to kind of go over it some. So totally. I'm, looking, I'm looking at this article here uh, written by, uh, let's see here, Professor Richard Roberts of King's College London, the official historian of HSBC and Schroeder's. So he writes about six years ago, the Battle of Waterloo on June 18th, 1815, finally banished the specter of Napoleon's domination of Europe. No one was more delighted than, a, than the denizens of the London Stock Exchange, Nathan Rothschild especially, as guilt soared on the good news. Now, I think what's significant about the story is we go down a little further, we dig into a little bit more about Rothschild's um, positioning there. Nathan Rothschild, founder of the London firm, was supremely aware of the value of early and accurate information. His firm's fortune was made by supplying the Duke of Wellington's army in Spain and France with gold and silver coin to pay the troops. Rapid and reliable communications were crucial for his complex and risky payments and arbitrage operations. He set up a private courier system with shipping agents in Dover and across Europe with fast light vessels ready to sail at any time. There were relays of horses to speed messages from the Channel to London and a farm on the coast of Hythe for courier pigeons. As night descended on Waterloo on June 18th, a Rothschild agent dashed to Dunkirk, conveyed by a Rothschild ship and Rothschild steeds, Nathan received news of the victory on the night of Monday night, the 19th, just 24 hours after the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington's official messenger did not arrive until Wednesday evening. So it's like more than two days later. Yeah. In the meantime, Nathan called on the prime minister, but was refused entry by a butler because the PM was resting. His duty was done. He proceeded to the stock exchange where he was in sole possession of the momentous news. It is not known how much Rothschild made from Waterloo, but it has, must have been a great deal. The collective assets of the five Rothschild brothers in spring 1815 came to 500,000 pounds at a time when the average wage was about $50 per year. In July, they held, in July 1816, they held $1 million. The Iron Duke observed that Waterloo was, quote, a damn close run thing, the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life, maybe on the battlefield, but not on the stock exchange with Rothschild's information system. So he was able to buy up a lot of assets on cheap by understanding what had happened at Waterloo before the rest of um, the LSE did. And he, of course, made money as a goldsmith. His family made money as a goldsmith. You referenced the goldsmiths. Now, mm -hmm. jumping forward not too long, we can see uh, that this is history.com. President Andrew Jackson announces that the government will no longer use the second bank of the United States, the country's national bank, on September 10th, 1833. He then used his executive power to remove all federal funds from the bank in the final salvo of what is referred to as the bank war. So this is a predecessor to the Federal Reserve, just like there were multiple attempts to establish the United Nations. At the end of World War I, there was the attempt to establish the League of Nations. There were also multiple attempts dating back 100 years now to implement a central bank in the U.S. And uh, there, it was controversial and, as you mentioned, debated amongst politicians and probably the public. However, today, people don't even know that central bank exists. They don't understand that, like, academically speaking, Federal Reserve is a public-private enterprise. Mm -hmm. So Jackson did not emerge unscathed from the scandal. In 1834, Congress censored Jackson for what they viewed as his abuse of presidential power during the bank war. So those are just kind of two tidbits um, from yeah. banking history, I guess, if you will. And I'm curious, uh, Eric, could you uh, kind of speak to the Federal Reserve and what it is? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, what, what's interesting about your point is under that bank, um, so the chairman at the time was Nicholas Biddle. And, uh, you know, he was a very intelligent, conniving guy who is using the bank to his benefit in a variety of different ways. And um, Andrew Jackson was campaigning for gold and trying to remove the institution. And um, what ultimately ended in that whole situation, because 
one of the things that Biddle was doing is like he was advancing payments to Congress and, you know, doing a lot of like under the table deals with different politicians. And that's pretty much what turned this into this huge war. So Andrew Jackson was like, all right, it's time to go to war. And he started to fight fire with fire. And he took away the U.S. Treasury or um, took away the function for the that central bank to be the treasurer to the U.S. money. And he started pulling all the government's money out of it. And Nicholas Biddle tried to deliberately create an economic traction and then run a media campaign, who is also paying off a lot of people in the media, and run a media campaign against Andrew Jackson so that he wouldn't get reelected as he was going through this whole uh, campaign process. And it was ultimately discovered that this was the case and Nicholas Biddle was removed from office and um, there was an attempted assassination on Andrew Jackson during this period of time as well, but um, which is debatable whether or not it's linked. But that being said, that's how nasty some of these problems can get with these bank chairmen, and that's how integrated some of these issues are. And I don't think it takes a genius to read the news and seeing what's happening with central banking to assume that these things aren't not saying that um, the central bank is paying off people in Congress, but I'm saying that the control over the media from financial institutions is very evident with the narratives that get pushed in consistent manner. So I, I, I don't think that that's gone away by any means. And I don't understand what structural incentive would change for that to go away either. But, um, but things can get very bad. And they, there's a lot of power dynamics that are involved in these situations. So like back to your point about the Federal Reserve, Pretty much after that, we went under this national banking system with like these wildcat banks for a while. Um, and the Federal Reserve was created by a group of um, seven members with the U.S. Treasury Secretary, uh, Senator Nelson Aldrich, and then five other Wall Street bankers. Um, and they had a private meeting and they enlisted a campaign of, and it was about $5 million where they paid, uh, made donations to Princeton University of Chicago um, and Harvard at the time to enlist academics to support reinstituting a central bank because people hated central banks because of all this stuff that happened in history. And banking was a very, you know, sour term in most people's minds. So they needed to get the academics on board. And that's precisely what they did. And um, and they campaigned for it for a while. And it wasn't an easy battle. It took quite a bit for them to get it through. And conveniently, it got through soon before World War I. Um, and <clears throat> once, once the Federal Reserve was instituted, its mandate was um, to create economic stability. And since the in, um, creation of the Federal Reserve, we've had about 16 material economic recessions, which means we've had a recession on average every seven years. Um, and there are Nobel Prize winning economists that will support that the, you know, the Federal Reserve has patently failed at its objective for over a century. So um, that's what the history of it was and there's control and, you know, where, where, what it's made it was and how we controlled our money supply and um, how much gold it was backed by and when we became the global reserve. Um, and then when we ultimately removed the backing of gold, um, that's a whole other detailed story. But today, um, the question of whether or not the Federal Reserve is an independent institution and um, whether or not it's controlled by the government is something that's, I think, kept under wraps. If you go to the Federal Reserve's website, they still refer to themselves as a, they refer to themselves as a quasi private institution. Um, and <clears throat> Really, and this kind of goes back to some of this debt ceiling debate, and this is the same legal issues that they're going, going through right now, but um, the Constitution provided the federal government the power to coin money, not to create money, and that's where things get tricky, and it comes down to defining legal definitions, but the Federal Reserve at the time was created as a runaround because they needed a separate agency to create the money because the Federal Reserve is allowed, or the... Um, the federal government may not be able to create money, but they can issue debt. So they said, okay, well, what if we issue debt and then we just create this agency and that agency that's independent of us is then going to buy it from us and we give them the power um, to be able to create money. So like that, that's kind of what happens is when money is created, federal government issues treasury securities, the Federal Reserve just types some numbers on its computer and 
when the government spends it, it spends it into the economy and our money supply increases. And um, that's like the, the simple way of looking at it. So um, is the Federal Reserve independent? Well, it is comprised of a board of um, seven members who are elected by the president. Um, and then you have a separate board and you have separate Federal Reserve member banks who have their own systems. Um, but the policy of the Federal Reserve is heavily influenced by the people that are electing them to be in the positions that they're in. And, you know, Jer Jerome Powell is up for re-election at the beginning of this year. And um, you can bet that he wants to toe the line. Um, and when you look at the incentives of the system and how it's structured, it's very easy to say that the Federal Reserve is not independent. One of the biggest things is, um, so the Federal Reserve is the largest investor in the world um, as of 2019 data. And it is the most profitable company in the world relative to public company information. That's those profits, where do they go? Because if you go to the Federal Reserve website, they tell you that they're owned by the Federal Reserve member banks. So if you uh, go start a bank tomorrow and you get a charter from the Federal Reserve to be a member bank, then you contribute some amount to the Federal Reserve and you own stock in the Federal Reserve. Um, when the Federal Reserve generates its you know, 60 billion in profit every single year, 99% consistently, um, and you can pull up their financial statements and look at this, but 99% of that profit goes to the Federal Treasury. And so the profits go to the federal government. So if I think about ownership of a company and I say, well, who owns a company? Well, the equity holders do because they're entitled to its profits. Um, that's what's happening at the Federal Reserve is the US government owns the Federal Reserve and they're entitled to its profits. Um, but they say otherwise on their website. And But the financial statements tell a very different story. So um, there's, there's, and there, there's a lot more to it than just that too. The other question is, well, how, what are they accountable to? Uh, and what is audited? They're going to tell you that they are audited and they're audited nominally. Um, in fact, I think it's, uh, I would qualify it as deceit to say that they're audited because they allow an auditor come in and audit like 5% of all the information you could audit on the Federal Reserve. Pretty much anything that's important that people care about is not allowed to be audited. And it's totally at their discretion of what they wanna to give to an auditor. So they're not audited. Um, and there's a lot more detail that I could go into from there, but effectively there is a ton of misinformation out there um, on how these things work. And um, the Federal Reserve being an independent institution is laughable. You know, in conclusion here, is there anything else you want to add, whether that be about central banking, the Federal Reserve specifically, or Bitcoin? Yeah, I'll, I'll just tie it all out. Um, so, uh, you know, I spent, I spent a lot of time on Twitter, and I talk about a lot of these things pretty consistently. Um, you, you can follow me at uh, Eric, E-R-I-C, last name is Yakes, Y-A-K-E-S. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier in the show, I wrote this book to... Um, you know, get arm people with information and give a very measured approach to show people here are things that you can argue. These aren't theoretical, they aren't moral. These are tangible points that you can use to argue for why Bitcoin is valuable. And if you aren't convinced, then I, I think that it's going to be hard to argue with. So you should read my book and criticize it if you want and reach out to me and let me know what you think. Um, but it's uh, when I launched it, it was the number one selling book in money and monetary policy on Amazon um, as a new release. So it's been getting a ton of traction and I am working on an audio book and international publishers right now. And um, yeah, so get ahead of it, check it out and uh, reach out to me on Twitter and let me know what you think. We have had the pleasure of sitting down today with Eric Yakes. He's the author of The Seventh Property, Bitcoin and the Monetary Revolution. Thank you so much, Eric, for sitting down with us today. And thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, Justin. What's up, everyone? I hope you enjoyed the show. Head on over to goldsilverbitcoin.com for more content like this, as well as long-form written articles about precious metals, Bitcoin, and other topics. Also, check out our shop where you can get precious metals, 
storable foods, and all sorts of other cool survival and prep gear as well.